All right. Um, all right. Hello, everyone. Um, really glad to be here. And this is a JavaScript talk, <laughs> like Carl mentioned. Um, and the reason why I'm giving a JavaScript talk at PHP is because I think it's hard for PHP developers to not write JavaScript, right? Like, unless you're writing just like purely like a workload in, Java, in PHP, um, most cases we're writing PHP web applications, and when we encounter that, then we're writing front end code as well. So today we're going to talk about async await and really understanding what is going on behind the scenes with this, this specific feature. So just a little bit about myself. I'm based in, here in Chicago, and I work for Microsoft uh, as a software engineer. And before Microsoft, I worked for several other uh, companies and uh, industries like higher education and st a startup and transportation companies. Um, but throughout my career, I've solely focused on open source technologies. So like PHP, I was actually the organizer of Laravel Chicago, which I still technically hold the account. Um, so whoever wants to like take that over from me, can talk to me afterwards. Um, and I focused a lot in JavaScript, and I think it's a, it's a really fascinating language. So just an overview of what we're going to talk about today. So first, uh, let's explore this concept of single-threaded. Right? Like a lot, you, you can hear this a lot. Like JavaScript is a single-threaded language, um, and we're going to kind of see what that actually means. Um, then we're going to talk about callbacks. What are callbacks? Why is this necessary in a single-threaded language? Um, then we're going to talk about promises. What are promises? How are they related with callbacks? And then generators, like what are generators? Um, then we're going to combine these two concepts and talk about async await. Uh, OK, so that's a lot of content, right? There's just a lot of stuff that we're going to talk about. So just a heads up to kind of lighten the load a little bit. Um, I'm not going to show any code that's like in the newer syntax of JavaScript. Uh, so things like const or led or arrow functions, like if you don't know what that means, it's okay. Like we're not going to see any of that. Um, and all the demos are very, very trivial. Like you should be able to just read it line by line and understand what it's doing. Um, and for for asynchrony, um, we're going to just use set timeout. So there's no like complicated API calls to some other service you have no idea about. Um, and there are no errors, right? Since we're covering just basic concepts of what these things are. It's like the perfect world. You're not going to encounter any, any errors in the code that we see. OK. So um, I want this, this is sort of the reason why I'm giving this talk. Right? It's like I, I believe that the more we know about the past, the more we can kind of prepare for the future or understand what is coming up. Um, so in order to kind of go back in the JavaScript world, uh, you don't have to look too far back for kind of the start of Node.js. Um, so in 20, or sorry, um, 2009, Ryan Dahl gave his very first presentation on why he created Node.js. And these are like the links to his talk and his slides. Um, but the idea behind, or his motivation behind Node is that he, he realizes that the current way of writing things in the back end is like this, right? The way that we do in uh, I/O or things that that um, requires other things, um, you are doing it in a very like it looks like synchronous code, but he's like, but that's not how how computer is is running that code, right? Like here, it just seems like the computer just stops there, and until and then executes until it gets your program or it gets gets the value that you want, but the computer doesn't, doesn't do that. The, the computer moves on, right? And it uses this thing called contact switching to switch between different threads. And he's like, well, that's great, but we really shouldn't be writing code like this. And instead, we should be writing code like this. And he's like, the reason why this is, too compl uh, this is being rejected is because this is too complicated. Um, and by doing things like this, we can keep our operation in a single thread. And, he, and then he's like, oh, there's already a language that does this all the time, and it's JavaScript. That's how I, I wrote my runtime to support JavaScript on the server. OK, so this thing that he's advocating, like writing code like this, is a callback, right? So we actually experience callbacks every day 
or not every day, but very often in real life, right? Like when you go to a customer service website, you don't want to wait around on the phone. Like it would be great if once they are free, they can call you back, right? So literally, like I didn't even know callback, the word is a like an everyday used word until I went to Comcast. So I was like, oh, actually, I guess people use it as an everyday term. So, okay. Um, so as a web developer, we probably write code like this a lot, right? Like if you're working on a, um, a online form and you want to uh, submit a, all the information when someone clicks on the button, um, you have to write code like this. And, and then this is Ryan's example, and that's the, um, that's the, the chunk of code that is the uh, callback. So, but I actually um, created a repo that took his code, like his exact uh, program, and wrote a wor working version of it. Um, and that's the link, and I'll have all the links at the very end, so you don't have to like jot them down right now. Um, all right, so that's the callback. Um, now I want to kind of talk about this concept of run to completion. Right? Like, what does it mean when I say, this program is meant to run to completion. And run to completion is a concept for like, usually in like a language context, right? So JavaScript is a run to completion kind of language. So here's the, the code on the left. And this is just a really, really simple, all I'm doing is I want to console log this function that I've defined um, right above it, right? So I'm just trying to get some answer. And this answer, I want to add one to it and um, I want to convert this number that I just added one to to a string, and it will console log out that, right? Does this make sense to everybody? Okay. So let's see how this runs in this thing called a call stack, right? So it loads everything into memory, and it will run this. So that's like main is sort of this whole file. All right, so it runs main, and then it sees like, okay, we need to run this console.log function. And inside of the console.log function, it has this get answer function. And it calls that get answer function. And inside the get function, uh, get answer function, you see that it has the in words function. So it says, okay, well, now I need to run this in words function. So now it gets into the in words function and it says like, oh, okay, I don't have to run any more functions, it just returns this thing, right? The, the function ends or completes. So once that function completes, it's removed from the call stack. And then now that thing gets returned, and now the get answer has the th everything it needs to complete its uh, execution, so it will get out of the call stack. And it will do the, the same until the call stack is empty. So that's what it means when I say something is run to completion. Um, but in this case, this is, everything is synchronous, right? There is no async code in here anywhere. So let's see how this kind of operates when there, there is some asynchrony in, in the code. Okay, so we added a little bit of complexity, right? So the idea is like, the, the teacher is like, oh man, like, how did you get that answer so quickly? Like, no, this can't be a real, real like program or a real person answering this question. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna wait a little bit and then I will give the answer, right? So all I'm doing is I added this function called pretend to think and I will wait for eight seconds and then console log the get answer, which we, used, we saw uh, in the last slide, okay. Does this code make sense? All we added is this pretend to think with a set timeout with, of eight seconds. Okay, so, oh yeah, this one has crazy animations, so I gotta switch to my mouse control. All right, so again, we load everything into memory and we execute this file, which is just like main, this invisible main function, and then it sees this pretend to think function and it executes that. And inside of this pretend to think, it's first going to encounter the set timeout function. So 
it will run the set, time, set timeout function, and it will immediately put this thing called the call, callback into this other land. <laughs> uh, and this is going to continue on to complete the, the call stack. So notice that at this point, it's been eight seconds, and th this, uh, this callback is, is completed, right? But the call stack is not empty yet. So at this point, the call stack has to be empty. So it will execute until the call stack is empty. Okay, so it will complete this function. But at this point, this, this callback hasn't run yet. So we have this thing called the callback queue where it stores all the unfinished callbacks that still needs to be run, right? Um, so at this point, when the call stack is empty and there is something in the callback queue, this is when the event loop will pick up the, the first thing in the callback queue and puts it into the call stack. And from this point forward, it will just execute my get answer thing that we, we saw in the previous slide until it's done, right? So that's how JavaScript is handling like multiple things sort of in one thread through this thing called the callback I'm sorry, the callback queue and the event loop, um, and kind of coordinating between the, the different operations. Okay, so again, just to iterate, um, that was like a lot of things, right? There's a lot of concepts. So when I say single-threaded, I mean um, the, the program only has one callback uh, queue, I'm sorry, one uh, call stack and one event loop. Um, and the event loop will watch the callback queue and the call stack and will only put um, the callback from the callback queue into the call stack if the call stack is empty. Okay, so that makes sense. I know like, this is just a lot of hand waving and, and concepts. Um, and it's like not even the half of it, right? There's actually like, things like well, how do you handle exceptions, and how does it work in the front end versus the back end? So I highly encourage everyone to watch um, this talk. It's on YouTube by Philip uh, Roberts. It's a fantastic talk, and he had even crazier animations than, than my slide. So, okay, so that was callback and like how JavaScript is handling callbacks. Um, so it seems like callbacks is is fine, right? Like, why do we have to move on? Um, but like, who has ever written something like this for their program and their boss is like, okay, that's good enough, right? Like when you're writing any kind of information gathering, it's never just a name. Um, you probably want something like this, right? Like what's your name? What's your email? Uh, like what's your phone number? And these are all fake information, by the way. So <laughs> like birthday, maybe not birthday, but yeah, just like there's more things, right? So here there's maybe five or four pieces of information. Let's see how this looks in callbacks, right? It looks like this. Like that's crazy, right? You have callbacks, within callbacks, within callbacks, within callbacks, and ultimately, like this is not maintainable, right? Just by looking at this shape of this like pyramid shape of like nested functions, right? Um, so, so people have come up with more clever ways of of fixing this problem. This problem is called callback hell, right? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I love that. <laughs> okay, so, and we can't get away from callback hell because async is everywhere, right? If you're writing like a node application in the back end or even a front end application where you have to handle multiple API calls, uh, maybe you need like four different API calls to get the very thing you need to, to operate on some, some other thing, like you have nested everything. So we can't really get away from, from asynchronous code. So how can we fix that? All right, so this is the code before. So in ES 2016, or I think it's now just ES 7, um, do you have async await, right? Yeah, so um, this code looks very much like what Ryan said don't do, right? Ryan's like, hey, don't write code like this because it's not, sing it's not single threaded. But from th this point on, in the rest of this talk, I'm going to prove 
that this code is single-threaded and how this works. Um, but like, do you kind of see why people love async await? Because like, just looking at this code, like, it's just a lot more readable, right? Okay. All right, so in order for us to understand async await, we had to understand promises. So a promise is just a value that guarantees a future value, right? Like, I promised Carl that I'm gonna give this presentation. So like, in Carl's mind, yep. he's like, okay, good. Like, my job of being an organizer is done, so I can like, move on, right? So this is like, why a promise is good to, to kind of have in everyday life, but also in, in, in programs. So uh, in JavaScript, a promise is just an object with a then method on it. Okay, this is like the very first, very, very important concept to remember. Promise is just an object with a then method on it. Okay, and when you instantiate a promise object, it takes in a function that takes in two f function parameters or callback parameters. And here's an example, right? So we request the name, so this is the code that we had before, right, Ryan's example. So in order to kind of turn this callback code into a promise, we put the async like callback uh, code inside of this function, and then we have this resolve parameter that says, okay, just run this resolve function whenever we have the name, okay? And then at this point, we have, uh, then we can use this promise and say, by using this then method, which I will talk about later, actually right now. But, but just before we talk, I talk about the then method, does this kind of make sense, this how to create a promise uh, instance or object? Okay. All right, so let's talk about the then method, right? That's just this code down here, this then, we're calling this then method. So the then method, always returns a new promise. Not the promise that you just called, but a new promise. And the then method takes in two functions as uh, parameters. Yes, right. So the first function that you pass into the then method is the function that you have told your promise what to do, like after a resolve. So, so, okay, so this function right here that you've defined is this resolve function. It's almost like backwards, right? It's kind of hard to, to reason about this code. Um, so another way, when I first started writing like promises and, and like functions with the then method, like it's easier to think that like this value is being passed into this function. Like that's actually how I thought about it for a really long time, but that's not what's happening, right? What's happening is you're defining the resolve function in the then method. Does that make sense? Um, okay. So I would say the most important concept here is the promise is a object that has a then method on it. And when you execute the then method, it always returns a new promise. That's kind of the two key concepts here. Okay. So here is the extended example of the, the callback call and how we will refactor it using promises. So, you know, here's the callback call. Um, and then we've turned it into this code. So we would create four functions for each, for requesting our, our in pieces of information. Um, and then we kind of stitch them all together uh, with, you know, start off with the request name and um, you use the dot then, and then you then output the name, and then you do a dot then again, because remember, then method, uh, when you run it, it returns a new promise, right? So you can always chain then methods onto each other. Um, so it goes on and on and on until it's done. So with this code, right, here everything is kind of gobbled together, 
in this one, one function. Um, but here, we sort of kind of separated the, the code a bit, right? Like we, we have the, what I like to think as kind of the async function like definition portion of the code and sort of the business logic key kind of thing down below. I don't know what the names of these things are, so, but you can kind of see a clear separation here, right? Like one is you're defining the async operation and the other is what you're doing with that async operation. Okay, does this make sense about promises before I move on to generators? Okay, all right. Okay, yeah, that's the separation, okay. All right, so generators. Uh, in my mind, generators is like this fascinating thing. And I think PHP has it too, right? Yeah, so I never used generators in PHP, like ever. Um, but I, I'm sure people have. Yeah, it's there, yes, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, there you go. So, um, okay, so generators. So what is a generator function? Generator function, in order to create a generator function, you need to just add this asterisk symbol after the word function. That's how you define a generator function. And inside of that generator function, you can use this keyword called yield. And I'll talk about yield a little bit. It's like a very magical thing. All right, so a generator function, when you call the generator function, it will cr uh, create or return a iterator object. And then this iterator object has this method called next on it. So a promise has a that method on it, a iterator object has a next method on it, right? Okay. So the next method runs or continues the generator function up to the yield keyword. And the next method returns, so when we run the next method, it returns an object that has two properties on it. One is the value, and the other is just a Boolean of done, saying has this generator function been completed or not? Okay, so this is like the five concepts. Um, and those five bullet points is from the previous slide. We're gonna run a, a program and just see how it works step by step. So first, you know, we start off on the top file. You can sort of ignore the boxes around the code for now. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. So we're gonna start at the top of the file and it's gonna load everything into memory, right? Load that generator function. And then it will run the generator function that we've just defined. And, right, it runs that generator function and it will return this iterator object, right? And remember, this iterator object just has a next method on it. Okay, so now we run the next method on the iterator object, and it will go into the generator function, and we'll start from the top of the function, and we'll run line by line until it hits a yield keyword. And then it says like, oh, okay, like I, I see this yield keyword and I'm just going to return the value to the right of the keyword. So it's three. So it's gonna take that three and it's gonna put it into this object with the, inside of the value property of this object. And since the, the generator function is not done yet, it's gonna set the done to false. Does it, anyone have a question? Yeah. <coughs> Uh, good question, so yes, so it's, it's not done because there's more code underneath, right? So we're gonna talk about it, like what happens when you hit the very last line, even without re the return keyword, it, once it hits like the very end of the program, then it's done, yeah. Okay, so. And you can have infinite yield essentially? Yeah, there, you could, you can create a uh, generator function in like, there could be a loop inside of your generator function and will just continue. And that's actually one of the, the real values of generators because you don't have to have like a preset number of things. You can just keep calling next 
if it's you know an infinite loop. Um, okay, so right, and then it's gonna run that or put puts it into a console, and it's gonna run the another next method, right? And then it's gonna go back to where you left it off in the previous yield, and it's gonna continue on, and it's gonna put that into the, into the console, and it's gonna hit another yield with two, and it's gonna put it into this yield result, and with the value of two and done false still, and then we can kind of fast forward here. Um, okay, so now we're gonna hit the very last next, right? So it's gonna hit this, and it's gonna start off where we left it off from the previous yield, it's gonna continue on, it's gonna hit the end of the generator function, and at this point, because there is no return, if you had return, um, you have a value. But now, there's no return. The value will be undefined, and done will be true. Right? <coughs> and then you exit. Do you have another question? Yeah, Andrew. You cannot, I, as far as I know, you cannot rewind generators. Yeah. I mean, you can always kind of keep a record outside of it, right? Like an array or something outside of your generator, but yeah. Okay, cool. So, so this is this is like pretty easy to understand, right? Like yield, it's easy to think that yield is almost like a return that can be resumed later. But I'm here to say that that's not the case. Because yield, remember I said like these, I actually don't remember what I said, but um, return, like when you, when you say, a re oh yeah, I said like these are yield keywords, right? I didn't say these are return statements because they're not technically statements, they're expressions. The difference between statements and expressions is you can return the value from ex an expression, right? So um, you can actually produce values from the yield keyword. So let's, let's, let's look at that, all right? So yeah, okay, so I forgot that I had this animation here, but basically, um, yeah, okay, yield, yep, can produce a, a value. So you can do something like this, right? You can assign a variable based on the thing that is being produced out of your yield expression. So, so the value is the value that you pass into the next uh, function calls, <laughs> this is so hard to say. The next function calls next, <laughs> I don't, okay, so I'll just show you the code, because this is really hard to say. Um, okay, so once you call the next method, right, and it continues and it hits the yield, um, all right, maybe I'll do, error. Um, okay, and you want to pass this value here. Right? So you have to actually put this value into the next, next call. Does that make, does that make the subsequent next call, the following next call. Right? Um, and then this value would be, will be passed in here. Okay. I, I'm gonna give it a second just to like, get this synced in. Right? So before, it seems like it was a one-way direction from the generator yielded out into the iterator scope. But now we see that we can actually pass values from the iterator scope into the generator scope. Which to me, it's like, is that, can you do that in PHP? You can, okay, awesome. So maybe, can you ask your question again? So I'm just, right, maybe I'm just thinking of it as a function, right? So you're passing in a, a uh, mm. So in the, in the top box. Yes. It's the value, yes. It's the value of the result of this expression. And we're just putting that value into a variable. So, so, so here, like, th th this, this, because it's, it's not a, no, no, I, it's totally reasonable, right? Because, like, th we don't see this a lot in PHP. Like, having some kind of keyword and then a value and it produces a value, right? Like that's that's like PHP doesn't really do that. 
a lot. Um, but in JavaScript, like you could have expressions um, based on just a keyword, right? Like type of. If you do type of of some random string, you're gonna produce a value of the string. String. <laughs> I don't know why I'm putting myself into these like, <laughs> like tongue twisters. Yes. One question: What's the difference if everything good is false? Okay. So if the everything is good is false, it would just be the object with the property everything good and false in in the in the variable on the top. Ah, uh, so these two boxes, yeah, like ignore the boxes. Like this is just like JavaScript code, like in a file. Pretend that it's just in a file. Um, the, the only thing that I'm kind of pointing back and forth is to, to kind of illustrate where the values are going and what is the order of operation in this case. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, no, just remember it. So here it's just like, the uh, next method produces an object with a value property and a done property. Okay. All right. So let's combine generators and promises. And we're going to use the example that we had from earlier where we've defined all the, the promise uh, functions, right? The functions that produces a promise uh, object. And we're going to put it into a generator. And let's see what we need to do to get this code to run. Right? So we're combining promises and generators. All right, so one step at a time. Right? So we run the generator function, and it gives us an iterator object. And we take this iterator object, and we run the next method on it. Right? And it gives us a done, a false, and a value with a promise inside. And remember, what is inside of a promise object? The then, right? It's a then method. So, so let's, let's get this promise out of the value. So we get value, right? Which is the promise, which has a then method on it. And we run that then method. And we create a function inside of it. And where we can get the name, right? And then we put that name into the next, next method, and we run that. And what does this produce? This gives us another object with done of false and the value of another promise, right? So we get that value, which is the promise. We call the then method on it, right? Which then we write another function when we get the email we pass that email into the next, next method, which produces a value, which has a promise, which has a, another uh, value, which is call next, which has a value, and another then. And then it's done, right? And, like, and you look at this code. You made callback the worst. Yes, exactly. You're like, what? <laughs> right? Like, this is so bad. Like, who would ever write this code? Like, this, like, we've gone backwards, right? <laughs> so, but if you think about it a little bit, like, we can sort of abstract the code on the right a bit, right? Like, that's not our business logic. We are just doing things like very, like, it's very monotonous, right? Like, we're just like, okay, we get the value, get the promise, and then we call it then, and we get another value, and get another promise, blah, 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 so on and so forth. We can put that in a loop. Okay, so let's refactor this whole thing. So here's like our uh, promise functions. But these functions, like if you look at it, they're all the same shape, right? We're just creating a promise. And but the only thing that's different is these variable names. So let's change that. Let's just call them data. And now all these, like these four functions, it's just one function where we're creating a promise and it returns this promise um, when, it, when it gets the value that it needs. OK, so here is the. Um, this craziness and see how we can refactor this code, right? So instead, so we're sort of inverting the order here a bit. So in the beginning, we are calling the function, but instead, we're going to say we're going to create a function that calls that function, right? So uh, we're going to create that function right now called run, so which just runs the generator function or just the, yeah, the generator function. Okay. 
So first, we again run the generator function and create the iterator object. And then we put this yielded object in this, in this scope, this function scope. And we create a loop inside of it. And let's, let's see how we will operate on, the, on this loop. So first, we're going to run the dot .next method. And it will yield out a, um, an object. Uh, and this object, again, is value and done. Right? Oh, yeah, I forgot I commented that. Um, and then we say if the done is if the done value is false, then we will just get the value from that object and call then on it. Right? So this, we assume that every yielded object is a promise, but that might not be the case. You might want to add some you know, if statements inside there. But here we know that every yielded object is, uh, is a promise in the, in the value uh, uh, parameter. So we can just go ahead and call then on it. And what we do is we pass this very function in, recursion, right? So um, that's it. Like this is like from that craziness to this, like that's not bad, right? Like we refactored this code. All right, so let's see how we refactor the generator. So this code from async await is exactly the same, except for the, the keywords. So like if you understand, so this is like the <laughs> moment, hopefully, right? It's just like we, we did this like the switch almost like the generator function, if we just swap out the function the star with async and, and swap out yield with await, that's that's it. Like this is how it works behind the scenes. Um, okay, does that make make sense? Okay, cool. All right. So there was a lot of like hand waving again, and like a lot of just trivial examples. Like how would this work in real life, right? Like how would you write this in real life? So um, I love this cartoon called Bob's Burger. And inside Bob's Burger, on every, almost every episode, they have this board, like a burger of the day, where they make like a, like a pun on some popular cult, or pop culture reference um, with their burger. So I created a, uh, a API where it gets, and these are real Bob's Burger names, just like a random Bob's Burger name um, and uh, with their explanations. So I basically scraped this website that has like just the history of all the Bob's Burger references uh, and made an API. Okay, so let's write our program on how we can use async await to call our API. So first, you know, oh, sorry. So the program is like you ask for your name and then it will call the API and it will spit out like your name wants a the Bob Burger name. Okay. So again, we define our async operation. We request the name and request the burger name. And here is our um, generator function. So sorry, this is not the async await, but as you know, they're the same thing at this point. Um, we ask for the name, we get the name, then we fetch this to the server, we get the random name, and, uh, and then it spits out the result. All right, so I, like that's, that's pretty much it. Um, this is sort of like my, um, like my one advice I would give everybody and kind of the, the standard that I go by is like always understand one level abstraction lower than the normal abstraction. And when I say normal abstraction layer, I mean like the, the services that you use every day or the language that you use every day um, so, yeah, and this is kind of the motivation behind this talk too, right? It's like, we can use async await, but what is it actually doing behind the scenes? Okay, right, so understand the basics, right? Because then we can sort of learn other things more quickly. And also, when you do that, it gets hairy sometimes. Like, like for me to kind of like grok this whole thing, like the relationship between promise and generators, it's just like, ah, like, why bother, right? So I would say just like resist the urge to, to like rage quit when you kind of 
go behind the scenes and, and peek behind the curtains. So, okay. Um, and here's like all the links of uh, everything and like the resources where I learned like the concepts so I can make this talk. Um, and the repo is uh, down below. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks.